Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome again to another episode of the uh, SCA Coaches Corner. Um, got a pretty good episode for you tonight as we let our uh, coaches come in here. Um, as always, we appreciate you uh, tuning in, watching. Uh, feel free to put any questions or comments you might have in the live stream chat on the Facebook there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put those up and we will get to those if we can. Um, if we can't get to those questions, uh, please don't take any offense to that. We just only got a certain amount of time and the, sometimes the conver conversation just kind of rolls. Um, but uh, all of these coaches and our guests will uh, be happy to get back to you uh, if we can't get to you here. Uh, tonight so feel free to to put those in there so um yeah tonight we've got an episode on coming back to fighting um it's something we've talked about in, in a couple of different forms uh, before but it's becoming uh, relevant again as as things are kind of getting back to the normal and we're getting back to regular practices again and we've got a, a, some great folks on tonight that have had some uh experiences with uh long periods of uh not fighting for some time and uh, how they came back so I'm going to turn this over to His Excellency Tristan, who is going to be our host tonight, and he's going to introduce our guests. And um, yeah, hey, I'll have a good night. Thank you, Sean. Um, and I appreciate you doing the, the producing for us tonight. That's a big help. Um, yeah, welcome everybody to the show. We've got a very timely topic uh, with our current situation coming back from a long break, although you could debate whether two years is a long break, but a lot of groups are starting to kick back up again. Uh, we've got a number of guests tonight that can talk about shorter term, medium term, and even long term breaks and coming back from a, a hiatus from, from fighting. Um, so with us tonight, we have uh, coaches Sir Helga from the West, uh, Her Majesty Rifkin from Antir, and uh, Sir Timothy. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure where you're from, Timothy. Where, where, are, you, where are you from? Antir. 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 Okay, great. Uh, yeah, in fact, we wanted to, to turn this to you first, because as I understand it, you came back from a uh, break of about eight years, and then uh, perhaps you could give us a little little background on that. Um, yeah, I was, um, you know, I'm, in my professional life, it was taking up a lot of time, the SEA and balancing a professional life, and so I really um, ended up taking off eight or 10 years, depending on how you count that, um, and then coming back after a long break was quite the journey as we went forward. Um, you know, my journey took a good two years to just get back to being a decent fighter. And then over the last, you know, three to five years for me personally, it's been just been really leaning into the process and getting back to a level of being a very good competitive fighter out there and be able to do well and crown and large tournaments and those sort of things. I've always been a tournament fighter, but it was a heck of a journey. Um, for me, the return to fighting was inspired by being stuck in traffic, looking in the rear view mirror and realizing I was rehearsing footwork for fighting and going, hmm. Maybe, I should, maybe I'm not done with that fighting thing. Maybe I'll give it a shot. And, uh, you know, I, her Royal Majesty Roken had a great uh, pl plan for me and set up a practice and gave me a shot at getting back in and, and coming in at the right speed and not just jumping in the deep end. So that's kind of an overview of my experience. Um, I will say, you know, I was very pleased. Uh, for me, that journey really completed when I got back to the point and I'm very, very you know, about five, three or four years in, um, I managed to do a silver rose in, a, in an on-tier crown here. And for me, that said, hey, I knew what I was doing and the return was complete at that point. Or as uh, my good friend said, uh, how's it feel to be relevant? It felt good, but it was a lot of work. So that's my, at a high nice. level, that's my journey. Cool. You know, as we were preparing for this episode, we just did a, a kind of a rough outline, but what we wanted to talk about were some of the different realms of uh, the considerations or grouped by by topic of coming back into fighting. And the first one, obviously, that's going to leap to your, our minds right away is the physical stuff. Um, and that is getting your body back to uh, a type of to athletic performance, uh, especially if you've been dormant with an injury or you've been, uh, you know, suffering from some kind of uh, physical problem that's kept you from fighting. Um, now, with Timothy, when you took your break, that that was more of a uh, kind of a work related yeah, thing yeah, rather than strong, injury. Yeah, it was a good mental break, right? I mean, it was balance and sure. work and, and life and moving through that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think the physical piece is real important for people to realize, which is, you know, I, I always make a joke, you know, be who you are, not who you were. 
which is a little bit of the mental side, but you really, if you're going to come back, and especially if your break's been very long, you re- don't go put your helmet on and go to practice. You're not ready, right? Um, the two things mm-hmm. I really focused on was making sure that I was doing a lot of what I would call training, not just slow work, but also thinking about fighting, position, space. There's lots of drills out there. This group is great for being able to share those sort of things. But I spent a huge amount of time doing that, as well as the big one for me was stretching. Um, and because I was very worried about being injured. I'm a big guy. And if I just go right into it, you know, I knew I was going to go out and get injured and then I'd be in this really vicious cycle. Right. And so I would say in, if you're going to return, especially after a long break, invest in your time in your training, right? Go do your slow work, go, but don't stop there. Go think about fighting, go figure out how you're going to position yourself, go make sure your armor's right. Go do all of those things before you go to your first practice. And then I can't stress enough, stretch, 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 stretch. You know, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not a little guy, but I certainly really appreciate, uh, you know, anything that has to do with stretching, yoga, anything like that. I know it might sound a little funny coming from me, but I'm a big advocate and it certainly um, is going to be critical on your return. Um, and then I think the next thing is pace yourself. You know, I think my first practice, I fought like eight fights. And I was like, I'm done. I'm out, right? Probably the best decision I made. I wanted to fight more. I was excited. I was having a lot of fun. But I also realized I needed to pace myself, right? If I was going to go out there and do 50 fights, that was not going to work, right? And so, and then the final thing is you got to plan for your recovery, especially, you know, I think it's true for all of us, but the older you get, you better plan to recover. Right. And you better have a plan for recovery. So when I say I'm going to go to practice, I know the next, you know, the next two days are going to be tough. Day two is going to be the worst day. Uh, I'm doing the investment in the things that are going to let me be able to recover quickly. Um, And so pace yourself, make sure you're doing your stretching, make sure you're doing your training before you even get to the field. Those are really critical. And then understand that you are who you are now not who you were eight or 10 years ago or or however long your break was and just really lean into that and be ready for your recovery times and have a plan for recovery. That that's probably the, at a top level, that's probably the best I could do to describe it. Yeah, that's a a great description. Um, I think Helga has, has some good points here too. Helga, you'd like to take it. I'm going to have to keep remembering to hit unmute so you guys don't get wind noise. Uh, So, uh, (laughs) So Timothy actually hit almost all of the points that I was going to go over with just the physical aspects of coming back, of setting goals, and then not allowing yourself to go past them, even if you feel like you can't. It's like going back to the gym after a while where you're like, oh, I can totally do more on the leg press. It'll be fine. No, no, stop there. You're going to punish yourself, and then you're not going to go back. So set yourself almost goals where you're going to want to go back. Set, ease yourself back in where the next day you wake up and you're like, I probably could have done more, maybe a couple fights more. But by doing that, you leave yourself a little hungry to go back and you leave yourself a little hungry to go train. Uh, and so that's one of the key things in actually setting your physical limitations is kind of understanding that mental bar and like then allowing yourself to go to it. And stop. Um, the other thing that to be hit is actually the planning for recovery. And I'm going to speak from, I've got way too much money in my right shoulder uh, and elbow. Uh, that stopped me from many years from fighting. Uh, I came back after a very long break uh, and then breaking my back uh, in the process of that. And physically, I had to understand the consequences of fighting and if I could adapt my fighting around those consequences. So there are certain shots that I don't throw. Uh, And at that point in time, uh, we're going to talk very strictly about training. My trainers knew that. So did my physical therapist. I would go to my physical therapist. I'd be like, this is the mechanic of this. They'd be like, nope, that is completely off the list. And then when my trainers or another person outside of my trainers would come and say, why aren't you throwing this? Literally, this is physically why. And they'd be like, okay, and leave me alone. I wouldn't try to people please. So physically coming back, again, you're going to set the barrier of physically, you must understand what you're actually incapable of doing at that moment in time. And so you don't then try to do it and set yourself back on the scale. Um, Hang on, I actually wrote notes, but I'm on my laptop, so I gotta like click over to it real fast. Uh, oh. The physical difference in your fighting can cause frustration. 
Uh, and so again, this is gonna this is gonna piggyback off what Timmy said is by understanding your physical limitations and allowing yourself to live within those limitations for a little while, you're gonna thrive and then you can regrow. Because if you just let, if you try to just push past those physical limitations, you're going to stall yourself out again. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to backslide because you're going to come out and be like, well, I was, uh, you know, I was Duke so-and-so and I used to just mop the floor with anybody. And then Joe Sh Smo Newbie is going to fucking smoke you for no reason at all, because you were just too physically slow at that point in time. Your body's forgot how to fire those nerves and you're going to get smoked. And then you're going to walk off the field and never come back allow yourself to just fail like allow yourself to physically fail and don't punish yourself for it but note where you fail and then that way you can take those notes and you can apply those at the gym you can apply those in your physical training outside of being an armor at practice and then you can better your plan and your progress so find your fail points recognize them and then train for them cool yeah, that's that's a good tip, especially that that ease into it. I think it comes down a lot to just don't go gangbusters and and uh, go flying off a cliff cliff in, in your exuberance. Um, your Majesty Rifkin, would you care to comment? Uh, sure, I the I have sort of the same perspective as Helga. Um, to me, like it's not just coming back, but but your forever training should always be sustainable um, to what your uh, work-life balance is and what your physical limitations are. Um, and so it's it's really important to pace yourself um, coming back in and do less than you think you can and then work up. Um, also physically, I, I the physical is like so, so tied with sort of the emotional and the mental um, because you have to get over your ego. Um, to let yourself be physically present where you are. Um, and sometimes that's really hard um, where you have to, you know, take a, no a note out of Duke Sean's playbook and um, reset your victory conditions um, on, on the physical part um, with fighting and, and the stuff outside of fighting. Um, getting your body in shape so that you can fight and that you can sustain having your armor on because you know just putting your armor on after a break that's a tough thing um let alone being in it so um just sort of reassessing that and then i also the recovery part um a lot of people sort of dismiss that but it is huge and as you get older and you come back i, I cannot stress enough the um the curative value of a hot tub or a bath with Epsom salts. Um, you know, like you might think a bath is not your thing. I am telling you, you should make it your thing <laughs> because I, if I take a bath after a particularly hard practice, I am fine the next two days um, unless I really overdid it. And then, you know, maybe I need a day, <clears throat> but um, <laughs> uh, you know, you just have to own up that your body's different um and uh embrace it um and and also get over yourself and you know what what helga said about um embracing failure um i i i call that learning how to laugh at myself um and if you can't laugh at yourself as you're coming back um you're probably not gonna last in a comeback because it is hard and it is really really hard when um a lot of who you are and how you identify is wrapped up in what kind of fighter you were. Um, and, you know, and if you were that fighter, you can be that fighter again. It's just going to take some hard work and you have to um, get over yourself the fact that you're not going to come back right there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to uh, the things that I wanted to add into the physical stuff is um, just a few things that, that I think everybody should be aware of just in terms of physiology uh, one is that muscles will start to atrophy uh, starting about two weeks after you stop using them now you can't just me measure the size of your quads or your biceps or your shoulders to say all right well i haven't lost much much muscle mass so i must be good to go and this will be you know a break of say somewhere three four months up to maybe a year or, or anything beyond that realize that 
that the muscles that the body uses to deliver uh, sword blows are a lot of small muscle, very small muscle groups. So you're not going to no necessarily notice if you start having atrophy in them over a long period of time. And the SCA and SCA fighting tends to have uh, it tends to demand very quick explosive explosive use of you need quick movement. So basically, you're doing a, a type of a plyometric. And for those who aren't familiar with it, you could you could view like a um, a plyometric squat would be like an explosive squat where you jump from a squat up off the ground versus a slow squat where you lower down and you lift weight. Um, these are exercises which are considered advanced. You need to condition yourself to prepare yourself for that kind of explosive uh, movement. And if you don't, you can injure yourself. And this is where the easing into it <clears throat> comes not only from the from the mental side, but just the physical of realize that your body weakens uh, more than you think it does over time. And if for anybody that takes a break after they, they've gotten, you know, a few years of experience, don't undersell what your body was doing to adjust to what to the fighting you were doing at, to that point, because every time you get an armor, every time you do pal work, every time you practice, you're building muscle. It's like you're hitting the gym for all of those little controller muscles in the shoulder and the elbows, the arms, the whole kinetic chain from your feet all the way up to your hand. And you probably didn't feel it because it's not like you're on a leg sled or on a, on a squat rack. You're, but you are building, you're doing conditioning for your body. And when you step away for a while, you don't realize how much you can lose in that atrophy. And then you go out and put your armor on and you try to explode with a quick shot. And suddenly those tiny little muscles start to get strained or pulled. And, and of course, whenever we take a break and we come back, we are older than we were before. We're never going to get younger as we go along. So, um, and I love the point about the recovery. Um, you know, the older you get, you know, when you're young, there's no such thing as recovery. You take a couple of shots of tequila, you're good to go. But as you get older, it's Epsom salts. It's, you know, uh, body work or massage. Uh, therapeutic massage, other types of things to keep your body healthy. So I, I can't, uh, just to add what everybody has said here about easing into it, um, ease into it for the sake of your body, because you, it doesn't take much, especially with all, with, I don't say all that weight, but even the weight of a sword, a fairly light one, can strain a lot when it comes to forearms, wrists, elbows, shoulders. Uh, if the forms may be a little off, and of course, like every skill, what uh, SCA fighting is a perishable skill. Um, through disuse, it'll get a little rusty. Your form will start to break down. And in your mind, you think you still got it, but the body will be off a little bit and it doesn't take to be far off before uh, strains start happening. Um, so were there any other points anybody wanted to uh, make or add on to the, the physical aspect? Helga. Uh, so I realized today, one of the things that we can stress on this episode is start all these behaviors early. Likely, in the sport or outside of the sport, you're going to have an injury. You're going to have a break. You're going to start a family. You're going to buy a house. You're going to blow a knee. Like, what we do is not friendly to our body. Start the behaviors early. If I go back and slap 16-year-old me, I would. Like, just... That is not Honda Civic. It is not cheap to replace. Stop driving it like that. Like, and so what we need to do is teach it on the other side of this is besides just teaching yourself this, teach your students this. If you go out and stretch, your students will go out and stretch. If you talk about your care routine, your students will do this and it will become normalized within it. We can get rid of the macho bullshit of just like, oh, I don't even do, you know, I don't do slow work. Slow work is for sissies. You want to know what? Slow work saved my elbow. Um, and so if we teach this now, if we exhibit this as trainers and as coaches and as students, guess what? The rest of the people are going to follow. A lot of us are going to be fighting into our 60s and 70s because that's the coolest thing about our sport is there's not a body type. There's not an age category. And the better we take care of ourselves and the better we teach each other to take care of ourselves, the longer we all get to fight in this amazing society. There we go. There's my soapbox. Perfect. Um, you know, it, it occurs to me one more thing to cover 
would be coming back from an injury, not just a, okay, real life sort of intruded, or I needed to take a, like a mental health break, but a, I've had a knee strain, I've had a back injury, I've had something that has kept me off the field. I think even there, you have a, a greater responsibility to your body to make sure that you don't overdo it. And I've had two strained knees uh, through, through my fighting career, and I had to show a lot of patience coming off of those because, uh, and for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of a knee strain, uh, you will often get internal swelling that can even keep the, the leg from being able to bend. And it will very slowly, very, like painfully slowly go diminish over time. And then it will get to where you can feel like your knee is normal, but there's still internal swelling in it. And once it feels normal, now you've got about a uh, six week to two month to maybe three month window where it's still vulnerable, but you can't feel it. That's when you have to be the most careful for re-injury. Um, and that's just, that's just from a knee, but I, I, I believe with, you know, and I actually had a shoulder surgery too. So I had to come back from that. Um, you have to treat your body with much more care and restraint. When, even when you think everything feels great, that's when you have to come, uh, you have to take real care. So uh, Rifkin. Yeah, so I wouldn't call it an injury. Like uh, Helga is the queen of uh, injuries. So I'm going to let her talk about injuries after me. But um, I have the experience of coming back after having a baby um, and having an unexpected C-section, um, which definitely changes um, your your platform. <laughs> um, so coming back from that, you, you definitely have to um, think about power generation differently. And what, what I decided when I came back from having a baby one, I decided that, um, that I was going to be good and that I wasn't going to, um, uh, let, let my past self define me. Um, and I decided to sort of not start over, but really become a student, um, and really focus on how I was generating power and, um, I read books and uh, did a whole bunch of different things to figure that out um, and worked on my core. I mean, the stuff off the field is so important physically when you're coming back from something that has changed your body um, for you to have the core strength, um, especially a C-section um, and to have, you know, just the ability to, um, to, generate power from a base um, or, or to have a base even. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think when you come back from something like that, you really have to listen to your body um, and do the work, um, the stretching, like stretching is so important. I wish I had done that in my twenties um, and to do the recovery work and to just, you know, listen to your body. And when your body tells you that you've had enough, you don't need to push for the extra four fights. Like that, that was something I was sort of brought up with. Like you always want to be the last person on the field. You don't need to be the last person on the, no, that's not your fault, Tim. <laughs> Tim was my knight um, for people that don't know. Um, but uh, I think when you come back from an injury, like you need to just, um, find your voice and be able to tell people that you are on your own path. Um, you are listening to your body and, um, this is what you're capable of now and not let people pressure you into, um, hurting yourself more, but I'll let Helga go because she's got great injury stories. <laughs> All right. So a couple of you guys have watched episodes before uh, where I talked about, uh, I have I have three shoulder surgeries, I have three elbow surgeries, uh, and then they went and did a, uh, a bad cleanup uh, on, and broke my back twice, and my neck or confirmed once, I broke my neck twice. Uh, one of the things that this does is this accelerates how you have to treat your body. Any injury, is like a marker character sheet that like, now you must ice your arm after fighting, no matter what, no matter how nice you are, no matter how much you change your uh, mechanic and everything else like that is, so coming back from injury like that, a lot of us come back and I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop over to the mental side. Uh, this will slide right into the next question. Coming back from injury, injury like that, you have to mentally see yourself 
for a level of suck and you need to be okay with it. Um, and one of the things you also need to do is allow your body to suck because your brain may be 110% into this and want to get back and want to prove that you can come back from that injury, everything else like that. And your body says, nope. Like you get two fights tonight. That's it. You better choose your two fights real well. Um, and so I'm just, all of us are kind of saying the same thing. Uh, you need to listen to your body, whether it's coming back from a long break and learning how to refire those finite muscles that we all develop all the way from you've had major abdominal surgery, you've had major joint re reconstructive surgery, or you've even had minor stuff. You need to listen to your body about this and get over the ego that says, I want to be here. I'm really enjoying myself. I want to be with my friends. I want to prove that I'm back and everything else like that. I want to do those two more fights. Yeah, I'm tired. My hand can't hang on to anything right now. Um, and you need to just not. This, is, this entire episode is about the death of the personal ego. Um, and so we're all going to go over this multiple times. Of If you have an injury, listen to your physical therapist. Tell your trainers what's going on. Tell your friends what's going on. Because sometimes you're going to be a dumbass and they're going to tell you no. That's what Hebeck did for me. We go out and train and we train and train and train. And he would look at me and be like, you can't hang on to your stick. I'm like, no, 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 I'm fine. I figured it out. Nah, we're done. Fine. So he'd be the little ego killer for me where he'd be like, nope, we can work on footwork, but nothing's going in your hands. Uh, and so that's one of those things. It's like, occasionally be smart enough to have a safety buddy. When you say, I feel like I'm coming back. And Tristan actually pointed this out. I feel like this joint is normal again. I'd really like this. At this point in time, just understand you're probably stupider mentally than your body is. So go to a friend and say, I'm recovering from this. I need you to be my safety buddy. If I start walking funny, if I've got a little bit of a limp, I need you to go take my helmet away. I need a babysitter. Can we please do this? Like, I, just babysit me a little bit because I'm, I'm stick dumb right now. Uh, and that's going to be one of those big things is, Remember when you get dumb? Remember when you get too excited to be on the field? Uh, and find your safety buddy for that. So that was a really weird rabbit hole, but there you go. No, that was good. Uh, Sir Timothy. Yeah, I think um, just practically speaking, we've been talking about know your limits, have goals, blah, 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 blah. I can't under, you know, I can't stress enough. Find, sit down and write it down. For me, it's about smart. You know, Misty, I think one time I shared my spreadsheet with Misty. It's like seven pages long. I am an absolute advocate of smart goals. Find whatever works for you, but write it down. It's going to give you a plan when you get to practice, when you get to the event. You're going to find the definition of your boundaries with that. If my goal is to go have five fights and it's a smart goal and I achieve it, I feel great, I've achieved something, but it also gives me a boundary. Oh, I don't have to go have 15 fights. How many is enough fights, right? And so by, so I think that construct of smart works well for me. The big thing I tell everybody is write it down, make them reasonable, and they'll give you a plan for when you're there to help you. I mean, there's so many times I wanted to fight more, especially if that last fight, something went right. Woohoo! I mean, no, no, I don't, ease off here. That's not part of the plan. Let's get back on schedule. You know, so that's number one. Number two, Share with, your, share with the people you're fighting with. Hey, I'm just coming back. I completely suck. I want to be better. Can you help me out? Right? I don't know how many people stop fights with me and said, hey, man, you look exhausted. How about you just take a break? Right? So mm -hmm. lean on your community and be, I, I know, be vulnerable. Don't, I know it's not macho, but let it go, man. Right? And share with folks. Let them know. They'll help you through this. Right? You don't have to do it alone. You're going to do it alone if you don't share, though. Right? And then I, everybody's going to laugh at this one. But damn it, put your armor on before you go to practice. Put it on. Walk around in it. Do your slow work in it. Carry your shield. Make sure your stuff fits. Do not show up to practice and have you having to punch seven new holes. There's nothing more disappointing than that because you put on a bunch of weight or you know, stuff doesn't work, right? I mean, come on, sort it at home. Get comfortable, make the changes you want. You don't want to be fighting that, right? 
And so if you're doing that, then when you get there, you can enjoy that moment. So investing, those are just some really simple, practical things. Write your plan down, have a plan, share it with folks, ask them to help you with it. And for goodness sakes, do your slow work, put your armor on before you go to practice, because that's not where you want to find out stuff's not working. Right? So that's, that's just kind of my, my two cents. Yeah, and that's a good bridge into the next the next uh, area. And we've already talked a little bit about the mental aspects uh, and managing your expectations as you go into taking up fighting again. Um, one thing that I, and I think that this is a good bridge from the physical, and that is, let's say you take a break for two years, three years and come back, and maybe you put on 15, 20 pounds. Realize you're dealing with a different body now than you were before, or or even more, or maybe you've lost weight. Maybe you, know, you used to be heavier and now you're, now you're lighter. You're gonna move a little differently. Um, just appreciate that when you do that restart, you are really, re it's like a, a race car driver getting in a whole different machine. Um, you may think you're behind, you're grabbing the, a, the same type of a steering wheel, but everything under the hood is gonna be a little different. And, um, and I think that this is one of those things which is, although it weighing more or having a different body seems like it's physical most of it's a mental thing where you have the expectation of i'm going to fight like i did you know five ten years ago uh and i'm going to try to move the same way i did but then you realize your body is just physically different enough that it's not working very well uh and that's going to be i think the first part of the mental is taking stock of where you really are uh remove the expectations kind of like uh, was mentioned earlier you're not going to fight the way that you did you know, even now from a break, like what we're talking about for these last two years, you're not going to fight the same way you did two years ago. In fact, that could be a very good thing. And what I've found is that a lot of people uh, that, that I've seen, and even myself, when I had to take a break from fighting, they would get into a mental space of, oh my God, my skills are deteriorating, or they have deteriorated from this break. And they, they turn that into a mental uh, hurdle where they, they are, get down on themselves. Like I should have gone to practice or I should have kept in shape. I should have been doing drills when I couldn't get an armor. I should have been, you know, they beat themselves up and they say to themselves, well, I've lost so much ground. And the, the mental thing that I would, I would recommend to those people and say is to say, okay, yes, you may have had some of your skills perish a little bit, you know, diminish, but the one thing that you can use is actually taking that break to say, maybe you had some of those things that you had bad habits in there and maybe those diminished. And maybe now if you take your mental focus and say, I'm going to get rid of those bad habits. They're, they, I've, they're not, I've not been repeating those for every week for now for the last two years. Now I'm going to take a fresh look. And I love what Timothy said about writing down what, what it is you want to do, write down what you what you want your good expectations to be, make sure they're reasonable, and maybe have with uh, on that list say, I'm going to get rid of some of these old bad habits that I that I know I always had, and now I can say I haven't practiced those bad habits for the last two years or four years or whatever, and now I'm going to start and do it right. So, who'd like to comment on on the the, the mental a little bit more on the mental aspect? Helga, why don't you, I'm going to throw it to you and go. I like how all of us are overly polite. So like when, when he asks that, none, all of us are like, somebody else should go first. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to talk about a couple things. So we've, we've all bridged over in the mental part because our physical and mental states within fighting are so similar. So it's, this topic just crosses over really fast. Uh, and so I'm going to talk on a trainer, like a little bit of a little bit more of a trainer aspect in this is allowable failure. Uh, and I touched on this already in the talk, um, how the physical difference can be adjusted for playing with styles. Um, and so this is a very weird kind of finite way to deal with it. All of us have ego about our fights. Uh, to say we don't have ego, I'm sorry, none of us wear halos. All of us have an ego about being as good as we are, even if we were coming back. Some of us are good enough to set it aside. Some of us need tools to set it aside. And sometimes you have to develop tools. Maybe it's picking up a different style. Why do you think I fight with a 12 by 19 heater? Because I blew out my shoulder. 
and I was actually pretty good before I blew out my shoulder. And when I came back, my style had to completely change. And then I had another small injury with my wrist where I couldn't hang on to my center grip kite. Like, there's a year where I was, quote, a heater biker, end quote. Also, I'm really sorry if the, the siren's picking up. Um, because I, I had a mountain bike wreck and I just jacked my wrist up really bad. Um, and so I went to the theater because I realized I was finding frustration in the fact that I wasn't being successful. I should have been su successful. I should have been able to walk back in and make the same pile of bodies and everything else that was going on and have just as fun in my fighting. And I wasn't. So I just yeeted the entire style. I picked up a whole new style because what it did is it allowed my ego to say, well, it's okay to suck at that. Sometimes we cannot get over ourselves, so we have to find tools around that. And that goes in, in recovering injury, recovering from a break. Find the tools to get over yourself. And sometimes I'm sitting there and being the Zen Buddhist monk that I wish I was, but I am not. I would like to, I would like to totally like to say that I can just set aside my ego. I can't. I really, I understand myself on that. And so how I found is I'll just change styles. I'll pick up a style I've never picked up. And all of a sudden my brain, my ego says, you're allowed to suck and play. And then I learn what my body needs to do. I learn where my fitness has failed. I learn where everything is. And I go back to play, which allows me to be better overall in the sport. So thus, when my body is healthy enough to pick up what I used to be successful at, I don't suck anywhere near as bad. And I don't have those ego moments where I'm just like, why do I even do this anymore? And so you got to learn what you need to do to manipulate yourself. Um, and then the other thing that I'm going to talk about real quick is actually on that trainer student aspect. And this goes both ways. As the person coming back or the person having somebody come back, you need to know the acceptable line of teasing because all of us are rowdy. All of us want to tell our friends, do the other two fights. Oh my God, you suck so bad. How did I hit you with that shot? There are times where that is acceptable and there are times where that is really detrimental to somebody recovering from an injury, recovering from a long break or anything else like that. So you need to have a conversation on both sides. So either you as the person that is receiving this or as the person doing this needs to be open to the conversation of that was not helpful at all. I'm having a bad day. Like, I don't need to hear that I suck. I showed up and that was my victory condition and I'm here. We don't need to have those confrontational, those things. And we really have to watch these conver conversations when somebody is coming back because they are going to lack the muscle memory. They may be recovering from an injury. They need a little bit more encouragement. So we as trainers need to provide that and say, cool, I'm glad you're here. The goals. Your goal is to not get hit with a flat for the first, like uh, the first two shots. Sweet. We're working on that. Great. Raw, raw. I'm putting on the pump. Instead of teasing them and telling them, hey, I hit you with a flat snap in those first two shots. I thought that was your goal. That difference is huge. And that difference will change the community. Um, and that going as a student, we need to be able to know to ask for encouragement uh, on that mental side effect. When we're coming back from an injury, like I'm afraid to full, throw a full flat snap because last time I did that, it hurt really bad. And so can we go do rounds where I'm throwing this thing, where I'm throwing this shot? So asking for encouragement or like, hey, tonight, I'm not in the space to hear any negative feedback. I only need the positive. Next time, hopefully I'm in a better place. Like, but I know right now that if you give me negative feedback, I may never put my helmet back on. If we can own that, both as trainers and students, we're going to see so many more people come back because we're going to allow them to suck and allow them to tell us what they can hear at that moment in time and what they can't. So there you go. So I would like sure. to go a step further with that because um, I think as a community, we really suck at letting people know that we miss them and that we're glad they're playing. Um, because what we usually say to them is, it's so good to finally see you out here. Oh, it's great that you put your armor on. And when, when you hear that after coming back from a break, it's like, why the hell am I here? Um, all these people are giving me crap. Um, like they're basically telling me I'm not living up to um, 
my peerage or I mean, whatever it is. Um, and most of us um, who come back from a break already are berating ourselves for not doing the things that we think we should have. And when people say backhanded things like that, it just reinforces um, that sort of trepidation in people that maybe this isn't the thing they want to do for fun. Um, so I, I just, I can't emphasize enough that people need to change their language. When somebody comes back from a break and you're excited they're there, just be like, I am so excited to see you today. And I love it when you come, when, when you're here. Um, it's just, it makes me happy. Like something like that is so different than judging the person for never being there and finally being there. And it might seem like a really small thing to a lot of you, but it is huge. Um, I don't know how many people I have heard complain about that, um, about feeling judged when they come back. Um, yeah, especially, you're right, Helga, especially for our aging fighters. Um, like, if you want to see those guys out there, um, just tell them how much you love them and how much you love having them around. Don't give them any, <laughs> any kind of judgmental um, stuff. I, I think it's super important. Um, I also want to talk mentally about, um, um, from the other perspective, about sort of creating your environment um, so that it's what you want for yourself and it's fun. I think one of the hardest things about coming back um, is that it can be so physically demanding and it can be so disappointing um, not to be where you want to be or where you think you should be, that it's not fun. And parts of it um, especially if you want to be good and you're going to treat it as a sport, parts of it aren't going to be fun. But if there isn't that core of fun, you're not going to keep coming back. And why would you um, spend all your extra time doing this thing? So I just want to talk about um, when you come back, creating your own environment that makes it fun for you. And I actually had to make a, myself a list. What are the things that are fun about the SCA, fun about fighting, and how do I um, uh, make that happen for myself? And you know, and you can make it help and happen for yourself. You can have practices with people that you like fighting. You can give yourself permission to um, not fight people you don't like to fight. Um, so uh, um, I just I, I think it's super important to um, create your own environment. Um, if you want to be a student, you invite people to come teach, um, which, which is sort of the path that I took. I decided I was gonna be a student and I was gonna have people come teach. Um, and, and by doing that for myself, like this selfish motivation, I actually changed the culture in our kingdom. Um, so like you, you can get all these really cool things where you can help shape the culture into what's fun for you. Um, or what makes fighting fun. And you have this whole like sort of domino effect um, that's not just about you. It's about um, making it fun and making it welcoming for everyone. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about was quality versus quantity. I think just mentally, it's really important to um, tell yourself um, that it's about quality and not quantity. And it's about sustainability. Um, a lot of people come back and they try to do an hour or two hours. And I just, it's, to me, it's just like, I, you're just setting yourself up for failure. You're like, make it so that you do five minutes after dinner, five minutes every day for a hundred days, and then you can put it up a little bit. Um, but everybody has time for five minutes. Um, so anyway, I'm going to let Tim talk, but that, those are sort of my main things. Um, yeah. Look, I've got something to say for coaches out there. Um, Sagan said something to me. I think I've been back less than a month in actual armor. And he happened to be out here teaching class. And he took me aside and he said, you haven't been fighting a long time, I can tell. And I was like, to be honest with you, I sucked all day. It was horrible. I was, in, I was at the bottom. I don't know if I would be here today without this like just very brief comment. And Sagan looked at me and he said, don't worry, it'll come. You're doing the right things. Trainers do not underestimate that moment of inflection that you can impart to somebody to get them past it. Um, and just, it's hard. Um, you know, I was over 40 when I returned to fighting, a lot closer to 50 than 40. 
Um, the first day back was incredibly hard. Sean, Sean was just saying, uh, you know, one of the things I say is that at some point we all have to have our first day back. We're going to have an injury. We're going to have something occur and you're going to have to have it. Right. So everything happening on this call is certainly relevant for that moment, but it's also common to all of us. And whatever your reason for leaving or whatever, your, you know, whatever your break was, we're all going to go through it. There's a commonality to it. And everything you're hearing on this call tonight is relevant for trainers. Please lean in and pay attention to your older fighters who are returning. We may have been great. We may have been all of that. But I can tell you right now, we're in our head. It's tough. It's hard. We don't remember. You know, we remember who we were. And I can tell you, it sucks to get your butt kicked by somebody who you used to not, who never touched you before eight years ago. And I may not be showing it on the outside because I'm a macho guy and I'm a knight. But I need your help. And some of the people who helped me most, Sagan's a great example, but they were the unbelteds in this kingdom who came to me and said, I heard so much about you. It is so cool to see you on the field. That got me out again and again and again and again. So I just don't underestimate that. You know, the community supporting folks returning is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. So that's just my, my two cents. I'm going to shut up before I get all emotional and blow my macho side. Thank you, Tim. That was uh, that, that was very insightful. Um, we did have a viewer question from a few minutes back, and uh, it's I think it's relevant as we wrap up this point on the mental aspect. And, and the question was, besides slow work, just trying your armor on, what are some good things to do to help you get back in armor and get back to your old self? And I think the the advice as we as we covered this is, don't look at getting to be your old self. Look at getting to be your new self. And that may include adjusting how you use your body, adjusting to an older body. You may find things that work now that you can develop that you never, it never occurred to you back when you were active, when you were younger, maybe because you were more impatient when you were younger, maybe because you were more impulsive or you were, you were a different person, not only physically, but you were also a different person mentally. Hopefully with age comes maturity as well. So you will be a little bit more mentally on the ball than you were as a young person. You don't want to go back and slap yourself, for example. <laughs> but but as we grow older, we the goal really should be that we take on fighting in a smarter fashion, a little bit more organized. And that's part of what Co Coach's Corner is trying to do is to help people not just use their exuberance to go throw on armor and, and uh, throw themselves into the deep end of the pool, so to speak, but to take on their training a little bit more organized, a little smarter fashion and get more out of it than they would just from using their eagerness alone. Uh, does anybody else have any comments on this question? Yeah. I, or should I just I, call I, somebody I'll probably out? be a little unpopular here, but it's kind of who I am. Embrace the negative mindset. It, it's great, right? You know, I, I just lean into failure. It is mo the most empowering thing you can do. As soon as you abandon chasing wins and losses, and you lean in. I mean, when I don't do something right now, I don't get, I'm not, oh, I just, uh, I'm like, oh, 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 here we go. Let's get to work, right? Let's go get the smart out. Let's go get the fight. You know, let's go figure out the drill that's going to help with that, right? Lean, and, you know, there is embracing the negative mindset is awesome. Fail fast. You hear that all the time, too. It's just your approach to it. Right. And so when I go out and get one shot, I'm like, oh, it is on. Right. It's not, it's not, oh, I got one shot. Oh, I suck. Right. So just work, just also just start thinking about that a little bit if you're the fight uh, on the fighting side. Right. It's, man, those are opportunities. Wow. I get to go succeed. Look at this thing that I can't do that I get to go do and figure out how to do it. That's awesome. Right. So it's okay to, be ruthless in your self-assessment of yourself if you've got that embrace, if you embrace that negative mindset. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I couldn't throw a flat snap. It took me five years to throw a flat snap after coming back. My flat snap looked like this. <sighs> right? I mean, it was literally straight up and down, like horrible. Um, but I spent five years and I, Sean could just say, well, it's still not good, but it's flat. <laughs> So, 
uh, embrace embrace it. Go after it. It's great. Explore those things. And there are things you get to fix. And there are things you can fix, right? And just know it. That's 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 my passion for this. That's what keeps me coming back. You light me up. I guarantee you'll see me at the next practice stand at the front line going, bring it. Let's go. And you'll probably light me up again. That's okay. So, anyway. Enough. I think Last the coach's football. corner just had the first applicant for cheerleader. <laughs> that was well said. Um, does anybody else have any comments? Yeah, I'll, I'll, add, I'll add to that. Um, I, I think thinking of it as an opportunity um, to get better is the, I don't know if I would consider it a negative mindset, but um, to me, that is sort of redefining yourself and all of the really, really, really good fighters, that is what they do all the time. They go out there and they look to get their butts kicked so that they can find the holes in their fight. And then they think about it and they think about it and they think about it. And then they come back and they track that guy down and they've either fixed it and they're like, cool, you know, like that all that thinking and that opportunity to make themselves better worked or they take the, the new information and they assess it and they go back and they work on it. And if you can um, train yourself to stop um, criticizing yourself and judging yourself and trying to like, you know, wallow or get in despair about what you're not and instead of what you, what you can work on to be, um, I think that really is the key to coming back successfully is sort of embracing the suck as an opportunity to create yourself into something better. Um, and if, if you can't get there, um, I think it's a really, really hard road mentally and emotionally. Um, yeah, it, that's what I want to say. It's, it's all about reprogramming your brain to see the road and your journey in a different way. Uh, cool. I guess, yeah, the, the, this brings us to the third, um, the th our third realm of coming back to practice, and that is just the practical side. You're going to be making time in your schedule where you didn't make time before. And as we know, we don't make time. We just sacrifice it somewhere else for us to do, bring in the other things that we want to do. And you could call this, whether it's life balancing, um, you know, schedule juggling what have you uh as well as prioritizing because you're going to have to figure out what is what your priority is and i used to have something where you know i'd, I'd have people come to me and like you know i've got all these things and i i, I can't make practice this week or uh, you know but i'll do it next week and you know, after about six months of this you know somebody would they'd start voicing their frustration and say you know take a notepad and every time you don't go to a practice right on there what what you did instead oh i stayed home and had a pizza oh i relaxed on the couch oh i went and you know played with my dog or whatever and said okay all of these things are now more important to you than actually going to fight so where do you expect your fighting skill would be if eating pizza is more important to you than fighting you'll be a good pizza eater you're not going to be a good fighter like that's just the math of it so when you can juggle that list around and say, all right, I'd rather be a better fighter than a pizza eater or a movie watcher or a napping on the couch person, then your fighting will start to reflect that. And it's tough that nobody, you know, unless we're independently wealthy and I'm not, and hardly anybody is, has got the luxury of just saying, I'm going to go do, go do, take this up, but you give up something. And, you know, I remember back when, well, you know, some of the big computer games came out and we just, people vanished from the SCA. Like they just, poof, suddenly you wouldn't see somebody for a year because they made priority into, you know, adventuring some kind of a, a you know, character in a computer game. And that just, that filled all of their, their non-work time and sometimes their work time. Um, it comes down to those priorities. Uh, does, does anybody have some good tips for the, dealing with the practical side of adjusting your schedule? for taking up fighting, Helga. And bring on the sass, lady. I mean, the sass was for the last topic, but I actually have some, or like, 
Oh, if you've got some runover sass, please go right ahead. I mean, the runover sass is don't give a fuck about your own ego occasionally. Like, Mm -hmm. and uh, I would be the poster child for this is occasionally telling myself to go, like, fuck off so I can go train. Like, but that, that involves being slightly crazy and being able to have those internal conversations with yourself. So if you're that crazy, literally just tell yourself to go sit down in a corner and then go to practice. Um, but onto this one, I promise more sass. Um, so prioritizing, um, this is where the SCA has fallen down in how we communicate, how we prioritize the SCA. Um, because we only see each other on the weekends, because we only see each other at practice, we don't see each other outside of that training. And so we stop asking each other about that. Um, so when you're coming back from a long break, because we'll stay on topic for the most part, uh, when you're coming back from a long, a long point of training, you need to prioritize small steps. I'm going to go out to my pal. I'm going to do 10 minutes for the next two weeks before I go eat dinner. Cool. Great. You want to know what, if you're, if your treat rewards, like if your treat rewards of dinner, like, I don't care. This is like click and treat, man. You can use that on yourself. And understand what your reward base is to get back into training. What are you sacrificing? As it was already covered, what are you sacrificing in your time? Are you sacrificing computer time? Are you sacrificing, you know, hanging out with your family? Are you sacrificing sitting around on the couch eating pizza? Well, cool. I'm going to make sure that the reward for me going doing Pell time is sitting on the couch eating pizza. I'm not allowed to do that until I go do Pell time. Or I go lift. Or I work on my grip strength. Or I go fix my chunk of armor. Um, because I understand that I am a treat motivated individual. If you have food, you can probably bribe me into most anything like real topic here. Like I understand how I work. So again, just like overcoming my own ego, I'm going to use that system to build my own training habits. I'm not allowed to have dinner until I go outside and lift for 15 minutes. I don't care what lifts I'm doing. I don't care anything else like that and do 15 minutes of pell work. There's my thing. I must do 30 minutes of practicing to go to practice before I'm allowed my dinner. Um, And that is something that you need to understand what motivates you to change your own behaviors. Create a system around it. Do you need a buddy system? Do you need a cheerleader? Do you need a friend to show up to your house? Cool, great. Make a Pell night. Say, I'm going to start doing Pell if you guys show up. And you'd be amazed how many other fighters are like, I totally needed a buddy to do this too. And everybody shows up, somebody brings pizza, there's still the food reward because we're going right back to the food reward. Um, And that's how you create those steps in there to then create the going to practice, the going to the tournament, to making sure that you are changing your universe because that's a realistic conversation around so you can get back to doing what you love to do. It's not big changes. It's small incremental steps that you manipulate yourself into doing. Brickens next. So I I just, I want to um, sort of elaborate on that. There's a really great book called The Power of Habit, um, which is all about that. It's about um, how you have to change those little steps in the day to make the big changes. Um, if the big changes are important to you, it's those little steps that are going to get you there. Otherwise, it's just I want to be a good fighter. It's not all of the other things in there to get to there. And we all want to be a good fighter, but it's um, wanting it enough to change your habits and to put in the work and coming back from a break and being able to change whatever habit that was um, to these habits that are going to get you where you want to be so that it's fun for you. And, you know, fighting is fun, more fun when we're good at it. Um, let's just that's a, a truism, I think. Um, it's just it's more fun when when it when the things are working for you. Um, maybe I, maybe I'm alone in there, but I don't think so. Um, so structuring your life um, to to get you where you want to be is super important in a practical sense. And I think for me, like I I always go back to um, why is this something I want to do more than the other thing. And um, to me, that always comes back to joy and fun and people. And really, um, 
for most of us, the SCA, like the fighting wouldn't be as much fun without the people and the people are the people that let you fight too, right? Like we can't do this without our opponents. <laughs> so, um, so it, it always comes back to me um, whenever I, I'm having motivation problems, um, I have to come back to what is my core fun and, um, and centering my habits around making that happen. Um, also, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, um, oh, I just lost it. Um, oh, uh, for practically, uh, like practically putting it all together. Oh, I, I totally lost it. I'll let Tim go and maybe they'll come back into my brain. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. This is a little harder topic for me because I'm, I'm built a little different for most people in that um, I tend to be very obsessive. So if I, you know, I was talking about, I looked in the mirror, that night I was in my garage making a pell. I did pell work, horrible pell work immediately. Why? Because I go down the rabbit hole, right? I'm, I'm Mr. Obsessive Compulsive. I'm going to go all in on that. I will say some of the things that I think, um, I'm going to stress again, write down your goals. I love SMART because part of SMART is that they're time bound and achievable. Set them small, measure them, get that habit going and reinforce stuff. So I, I am a big believer in that. Um, but if somebody's very obsessive, for me, it's just once I get to the moment like, like oh, I love that. I'm going to go do it. Ah, I'm going to go in full time, which has its own problems. My, you know, more of my problem was trying to do too much, trying to go too fast trying to deal with the mental side of it was very difficult for me. Um, I will say, um, I will say one of my big motivators even today is I never want to have to start over again, ever, ever. It sucked. It was not fun. It was harder than getting knighted. It was harder than a lot of things I've done in my life. And I've done some pretty tough things. So right now, I guarantee you, I will not go more than a week without picking up a stick and going to a practice or finding a practice or doing something fighting related because I will never go through that journey again. I've had some injuries and I made sure I, I worked around my injuries and was able to do it. So I, I will say also embrace the pain of the past. If you're a ways into your journey and you see yourself starting to slip, just think back and go, do you do I? Do I really want to go all the way back there and start over? Because, um, yeah, it's not easy, folks. So, anyway, just a bit of unvarnished truth from negative obsessive point. Yeah, that's, uh, that is a good point. I One thing I wanted to toss in here in that when you, and I think everybody kind of had this when, I'm sure if their local practices started to get shut down with the lockdowns and whatnot, and for that first couple of weeks, you'd probably, when practice night rolled around you or day, you'd be jonesing, like your body would be vibrating that it's, it can't go do that thing that you do every week or every few days or, or, you know, whatever your schedule was. But then after a month or two, that probably subsided. And the, the thing that I wanted to point out, and I, I may have read it in that same book of the power of habit in that, um, it takes about 40 days to establish a new habit or to get rid of a bad habit that you want to get rid of. Um, and like what Sir Timothy was saying, you know, coming back, it's going to suck for a while. And the same thing for anybody that's started lifting weights or anything, they know that that first week or two is brutal. It's rough. One of the things that makes it rough, not, not only the, the physical part of your body, just doing something it's not used to doing, it's also making that the habit of the, okay, now you're going to go to the gym. You're going to uh, stick to your schedule. And in the, those first few weeks, you know, three to four weeks or maybe five weeks, your body wants to do the same habit that it did. Okay. Tuesday nights, movie night, or instead of practice night, and it gets into that, that habit. And so you could view that you just need to shift habits. So if you can hang in there and it's not like 40 days precisely, but in the ballpark of about four to five weeks, if you can hold a habit for that long, it will no longer seem like the labor it is in that first, that first several weeks. And I've heard the same comment for people that have quit smoking cigarettes or uh, given up drinking or, you know, given up any, any habit, the same thing hold formula holds true. Just hang in there for four to four to five weeks. And it's, it's not going to be pleasant, but after that, it gets a lot easier. 
Anybody have a comment on that one? No, I guess not. All right, so I think that covers a lot of the practical side of, of, of you know, how do you get back into the rhythm of your practices? And that can also include, by the way, not just local practice, but which tournaments do you want to go to? What events do you want to travel to? Uh, all that's going to be kind of a new habit again. I know for me, uh, I would I would have my whole year pretty much scheduled where January 1st hit, I would start my physical conditioning, usually with a target for uh, Gulf Wars. So about March is when I would start into the, the campaign season. Then it was, then it was you know, wars, tournaments all the way through until just after Penzik. And then there'd probably be a, a few other tournaments into about October. And then it was the holidays. So it's like, okay, this is time for my body to rest, stuff myself with holiday food, relax. And then January 1st hit and the clock started ticking and off I go. So even though it wasn't an even schedule, it was more of kind of like a, an athlete would treat their, their um, uh, you know, sporting schedule where they'd have the downtime in between the season, the, the, the uh, pre-camp workouts, and then they get ready for, get ready for their athletic season. And, and I, and I found that that was a good time to, to at least include some rest in my annual schedule and to make that my habit. Um, and, and, and I liked what, what we were talking about earlier in the physical side, uh, in the physical realm of, and this happens not only on an, on a daily basis of give your body some rest time and recovery time after your training, whether it's physical conditioning training or, you know, fight practice, especially as you get older, make sure that you allow for a bit of recovery that can also happen throughout the year where, you know, you do three events uh, on top of your local practices, you know, in a month, that's a lot on a body. So give yourself some time to rest periodically as well. Make that your habit, like taking care of your body, like a mechanic takes care of a race car uh, is, is an aspect to the physical stuff as well as the practical side, because you got to plan for that. Um, you know, knowing your body is going to be an important, an important factor. Um, any comments on that? All right, so let's move on to the last one. Actually, this, we're going to cover. I'd stress, I, I'd actually stress sure. as important as the physical is, and there's no question. I, I mean, you said it very eloquently and very well. It's just as important to give yourself a mental rest, right? There's mm -hmm. days when I am totally focused on what I want to go do, right? I'll even take things like, I'm not going to throw a backhand today. Zero of them. And then there's days I go to practice and I just go, you know what? I'm glad to be here today. Let's just go do this thing. I, didn't, I, I, I give myself a day off, right? So the mental, mentally is important too, to pace yourself. Um, I, 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 I can't stress that enough. So um, I think it's both. Physical Absolutely. And That's a great point. So, sometimes yep. Great point. Still have fun. Yep. And if anything, in the last few years, we are learning the importance of having uh, some mental health time. Uh, take the time that you need rather than winding yourself up to let yourself wind down and and find a good mental and, and spiritual emotional equilibrium. Um, you know, fighting is is not just a physical form. It's very much a, an expression of passion and an expression of motion uh, of emotion. So when your emotions out of whack, your spirits out of whack, your fighting is going to be out of whack. And uh, so get take the time you need to rein yourself in and be in a good place to go express yourself. Um, I think that that's important just all the way around, including the, like what Rifkin was talking about of how do I enjoy going to practice? How do I enjoy, what do I enjoy about the SCA? And that's what I want more of, not the part that frustrates you or, or gets you aggravated, whether it's with yourself or the environment or, you know, with opponents that piss you off or whatever. Um, all of that is is minding your uh, your own your own well being, uh, and I, I came across a great phrase just a few days ago, and I love it. It's it's mind your mind, and that is to not let yourself get drawn out into into garbage garbage thinking, um, garbage emotion. Uh, it's very easy to do these days, and that kind of brings us to the the last realm of this coming back to fighting, and I think that this is. Uh, would normally be 
in in typical situations where you know SCA was kind of normal pre pre COVID and you have to take a break and you come back, but now we're in a whole different realm where when everybody comes back, we now are at a very high level of of emotional and social tension, and it. On top of having been isolated to a great degree for the last two years, where, like any other perishable skill, people skills are perishable skills. We can be a little rough with other people. We can be rough on ourselves. A lot of people have been dealing with uh, notable depression uh, and other anxiety issues regarding everything everybody's been through the last two years. Um, it's it's we have to take a special a special care of remaining on the positive, avoiding being judgmental. Um, a lot of people that I know, I, myself included, love sarcastic humor, but it can it can with a lack of familiarity, it can seem acidic. And you know, I, I I've seen as people start getting getting together, all it takes is a little slip of here's my opinion on politics or here's my opinion on world events and and suddenly just a 10 second bit of venting can turn into this thermonuclear explosion of conflict and uh and i think that that's something that we really in this scenario in this situation need to take particular care of that we're there to enjoy a particular activity with our friends without the uh segmenting and and the division that seems to have really spread in the last couple of years um and i know this is a tricky subject because it, it's everybody's nerves are raw and and i think that that's going to be something that would be something that we need to avoid as as we get uh get back into the swing and get back with our friends because i don't know about everybody else but i'm sure i'm not unusual in the fact that in the last two years, I've found out a lot more about people that were close to me than I ever knew about, you know, th their values, what they held close, their their opinions, their politics, and whether I disagreed with them or not, I personally still cared for them. But I saw many friendships and families destroyed by these divisions, and I think I'd hate to see that the SCA suffers that same that same problem. So. Anybody have any comments on this on this one? Yep. Helga, take it away. Uh, so I'm actually going to push back a little bit about the use of the word friends, actually. So the SCA very before this used the word friends very casually. Uh, and we felt like we knew somebody over the weekends when we knew a persona. Uh, if you want to be able to set aside some of those differences, you have to understand that you are familiar with a persona. Uh, and over the pandemic, of course, you've gotten familiar with the person. Um, also, if we come back with the idea of getting to know people again, this is going to change the dynamic around the SCA. And instead of walking with preconceived notions, we can get to know people again. Uh, I guarantee I am a different person today than I was two and a half years ago when this all started. Um, and I'm going to give those people that I held dear that I hold on pedestals and that I hold as acquaintances, because those are all different categories, that same grace. They are different. And I am not going to try to shove them back into the box that they were two and a half years ago. And then I get to make that decision for myself. Also, I will highly, highly recommend uh, this is going to be, we're just going to put the soapbox on the ground because this is outside of the SCA and this goes right into mediation training uh, and this goes right to conflict resolution training. You need to go read Crucial Accountability and Crucial Conversations. If you want to come back with the tools to have these conversations within the SCA, you need to actually arm yourself with the knowledge of how people communicate, how we get defensive and we feel afraid and so thus we bite back, how people present their knowledge and how the pandemic has played across all of this. Uh, and so if we really want the SCA to survive this elephant in the room of everybody got shitty on the internet, no one is clean. Um, everybody got shitty on the internet. We all got to learn who everybody was. There was a thinning of the veil and there's a removal of the veil. The person we know on the, on the weekends is not the person that, we, that they actually are. 
we need to make those decisions for ourselves, but we need to make them from a healthy place. And we need to make them with the tools to have the conversations around them. So we can rebuild the STA in that. Are there the extreme ends that need to be removed for the safety of everybody between it? Yes. Did some of those people come to light? Yes. And they should properly dealt with. However, not everybody is on the extremes. And we need to recognize that instead of brushing it away. We can't say, oh, hey, you're just this person on the weekends. That ship sailed so hard. It is gone. It has been sunk. It has been sunk in like the worst Viking manner ever because we fired a bunch of like flaming arrows at it and missed. And then somebody else lit it on fire. Um, And so we need to come back in with new knowledge and new tools and actually step outside of this SCA context if I know somebody on the weekend and go actually take the time to build the tools, to have the conversations, to get to know somebody again while addressing our own baggage around it because none of us walked away clean. And until somebody is willing to own that, it's probably not worth having the conversation. Um, And this ties into this entire topic of coming back after a long break is because when you come back from a long break, people change. And humans, through survival, want people to stay the same because when we understand understand how they're going to act we understand the reasoning behind how they act we have this persona because as close as we are to people all we know is the character of them that we build in their our heads about them because you don't have their internal monologue you don't know their baggage you don't know anything else like that you only know their actions their words and the consequences around them so they are character in your story get to know the character again but make sure you got the tools to do it. So um, I would, yeah, go ahead, Rifkin. I just, I want to come at this at sort of a different angle. Um, I really think it's about looking inside yourself and realizing, um, putting your ego aside um, on a social level as well and realizing that everybody has a different perspective there is no such thing as truth and that um, you don't have to be right. um, And maybe there is no right. And one of the most peer like things any of us can do is to take a step back and actually have the discussion and not the argument or to have the, um, the maturity to say, wow, I've never thought about it like that before or wow, I didn't think what I did would be perceived that way, or um, I didn't know that was an issue. I mean, just just um, having the maturity to um, admit when you're wrong, admit when you don't understand, um, all of that I think goes a huge way into um, bettering our social system. And then having the grace um, to give somebody else the grace <laughs> to admit that they've made a mistake or that they're learning or that they're gonna be a better person. Um, One of the things that was so horrible about the internet explosion during the pandemic is nobody gave each other the grace to realize that maybe they didn't know what, what they were saying or what they were doing or like they didn't, we didn't give anybody the space to know better and then do better. Um, There were these these judgments um, and then there's the judgments because you didn't react fast enough or, and, and we've lost, we lost sort of the considerate, take all the angles and discuss it and maybe come out to a conclusion or not. Like you either were for it or against it. And there's so much gray in between those two positions. And if we would just, um, have the grace to take the time to um, let each other um, find that, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, I think socially we'll be in a better place. Um, I, I really think it's about putting aside your ego and having the fortitude to admit you don't know everything. Um, that's what I think. Timothy, did you have something you wanted to add? 
Yeah, I, I'll probably have a, a little different take on this. Um, and it's, you know, I've seen Branos's question in the, in the chat. And um, so first of all, I, you know, I think it's, a, it's for me, it's important to establish boundaries. And, you know, I've been back fighting a little bit and doing a little traveling. And I have people who are on many sides of these conversations, some of who've been my friends for a long time that I've been shocked by their positions. Um, for me, it's about the fighting field. Um, and I'm being very careful to have conversations with folks that I know that, you know, maybe things haven't been the most comfortable in saying, hey, man, first of all, I remind them and say, hey, the greatest gift you're giving me is to be here today and to, for us to have a fight, because this is what I love. And thank you for that. And just starting the conversation there and then saying, hey, if you want to talk about anything fighting, that's great. I'm here. You want to have a crucial conversation, by the way, that great book, go get it, read it, live it. You want to have a crucial conversation? I'm not doing that in armor. This is not the arena. I'm, I'll lean in. I'll have that conversation with you. Let's go have it, right? If you want. But, but right now, man, I just hear. Be my opponent. Give me the gift. Let's go have. Let's go have some love. Let's go do some stick love, right? And let's just keep it. In, keep the practice field and turning field clean because that, that doesn't belong out there. Now, that's not to say I'm, I'm not going to go have crucial conversations or I'm not going to explore these things or look at them. I'm just not going to do it within the context of fighting. And I've been really clear with people on that out of the gate. And so far, it's been working. I've had to say a couple of times, whoa, 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 you know, not interested, man. Let's fight, right? You should pick it up a hell and put it on. Hey, I'm fighting. You know, one of my favorite things, and I forgot who taught it to me was, I used to look at the uh, parking lot and be in armor. I'd be waiting for people to get in armor. I'm like, I am going to commence the fighting in five minutes. I would suggest you put armor on. It will hurt less. It's kind of the same thing. Somebody wants to have, talk politics, talk whatever you know, the, the situation is. Hey, man, tell them what's going on. Let's fight. Let's go, let's go do that thing we love. Because that we have commonality about. And the common word that I would lean into for everybody here, go look it up, live it, love it, grace. Give yourself grace, give others grace. I'm an old man. If I learned that a long time ago, my life would have been better. Please lean into that. Sure. And the, the question that uh, that he was referencing there uh, came from Bronis. He put this in the chat. He said uh, uh, on this topic, come back and leave the real, leaf, the real life behind like we used to. The question is, how do we stop people when they start up? Um, and I, maybe I'll take the, the first part of this because we're getting close to the wrap up point. And I would like to have everybody uh, put in their two cents on this one. And that is realize when you can step up and gracefully redirect and say, hey, how about we stay on, you know, what we have in common? Let's let's go out and, and get on the field and fight. Let's put on armor. Let's do what we're here to do, what we love to do. Um, you know, and I, and I felt this way way back when I would hear people at events start getting into very boisterous discussions about Star Trek episodes and things like that. Like, you know, and I don't need a thoroughly medieval experience, but having such a blatantly mundane, uh, over the top conversation that was not quietly done in somebody's private camp or, or, you know, off in their own, it was out in the middle of some common area where there's a bunch of people and, you know, of course, what we have now in the last couple of years is that times by like a thousand um, where, you know, people hear something said and they just their blood pressure shoots up and they just get the red, the, the whites of the eyes turn red. And it's I have to say something about this because I, I mean, we all feel very strongly about things that have been going on lately. That's totally understandable. And I love the the word grace. I think it fits very, very well here. And to be a damper on that, or for to people to try to be a damper on that political tension rather than being an amplifier. And when you engage in these types of, of discussions and arguments, and, and they're passionate, you cannot deny that people feel passionately of the turmoil that, that they're personally suffering or that they feel the world is suffering. It's totally understandable. And it's hard to contain yourself sometimes. But I think it is the, the grace and the focus on let's enjoy our time together and not worry about what divides us, but really focus on what we're here to both do together. Um, so that's what I have to say on it. Helga, you want to uh, give your your wrap up thoughts here? 
You're muted. There's my one. There's your one. one. <laughs> All right. So I think I'm actually just going to say go read those books. Because uh, one of the things when people start having boisterous conversations about uh, the, the things that occur in mundane life uh, is I feel that a little bit as a knight, uh, and this is where my hero complex is going to come in. I want to make it here. Um, sometimes it's my job to ID people that will be a danger to the group. Uh, and so I'll stick around in those conversations. If it's not, I'll actually leave. And if they ask me why I'm leaving, I'll tell them. I'm not here for this. I'm here for like this experience and to experience it with you. Um, I actually do this in the same context of people when they're bitching about the SCA. The laurels are to this, the pels are to this, the knights are to this, the gate fee was too high, blah, blah, blah. I'll just get up and be like, all right, I'll see you later. Um, and this is, there are problems that we can fix. There are things that we should address. We should always address bigotry within the SCA. We should, we should address racial tensions actually affect the SCA and how confirmation bias and biases exist. We should deal with people that are predators. We should deal with people that are outright, you know, like dangerous to any of our categories. Um, and that is actually legit. One of my jobs, again, hero complex. I am a knight. You want to know what a white belt says? I should be the safe person to come to with a problem. But I do not have to be the person that supports just out and out bitching. Uh, and so instead of making it, unless they're willing to have the crucial conversation, because I'll sit down and be like, okay, this is emotional versus logical. Would you guys like to go back to this? Literally have training on how to do this. Um, I'll just leave. I don't have to participate in that. I don't have to add my emotional tension to that situation. Is it a fire with a bunch of people around it? Guess what? I got a fire in my camp. I'll just invite everybody else to it. Peace. Um, and I think that realistically, sometimes you just have to vote with your feet. Um, and sometimes you have to say, like, right now, this isn't the appropriate place. Um, and it's really, it's taken away from this. And this actually isn't a danger to our population. If it is a danger, we need to have that conversation and we need to address that thoroughly without alcohol involved. Like, time to, time to talk about, do we have an issue? Do we have something that's a danger to the population? Do we have a bias that's going on within the society? Cool, great. These need to be addressed. But the little piddly bullshit things, vote with your feet and leave. There are other fires. Uh, Timothy, do you have, have something you'd like to add on this one? Yeah, I just think, yeah, I, just, I, I think that's really valuable. The, the piece that's really valuable is build a connection to the thing that you have and share. And I, I can't stress enough, the fighting field and practice is not the place to have that conversation. It's just simply not to start to set boundaries for each other. Um, and, and let's just create an environment where we can have crucial, important, meaningful conversations in the right environment. Um, I'd also say the same thing around the guide rails. Obviously, there are, are topics and issues and behavior that need to be addressed. That's not, I'm not saying ignore it. I'm saying have the conversation in the right place. And I'm pretty sure the right place is not at the time that we're standing around trying to hit each other with sticks. Very little meaningful communication is going to happen there. So let's just back off it, set some boundaries, enjoy the thing that we have together, use that to find a thread to get to those crucial conversations that are going to make a real difference in our lives. Sounds good. Rifkin. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add to what um, Tim and Helga both said. I think they both um, hit the main points of all of that. I just, I want to sort of address the bitching a little bit. Um, I, I'm all about creating your experience. And if it isn't, a, what did you guys call it? A crucial conversation or, a, or, you know, something like that. And it's really just bitching. Put yourself into the situation and figure out how you can make it better for yourself or what you need to do to, to see the thing you want to happen. So stop complaining and start doing um, there's so much room for doing and there's 
especially right now with um, the people that have been volunteering during the pandemic. Um, it's the same people mostly for two years because they've been in these jobs and we haven't been doing a lot of anything else. Um, there is so much volunteer fatigue. So if you think something needs to happen, my God, get out there and do it. And we're gonna welcome you with open arms. And, um, and I'm gonna put you to work, honestly. Um, so I, I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, create your environment. If you want it, make it happen. That's a perfect end point. Uh, these are all great points. Um, so thank you everybody for listening. Thank you to our coaches for coming tonight and our guests. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Uh, next week, we have a conversation with Duke Tom Tintinabulum from North Shield, uh, which will be very interesting. Tom's a very interesting guy. I um, believe uh, Bronis is hosting that one. Uh, so do tune in for that. Uh, it's been great having you. I'm going to write these, these uh, two books down, the one on habits and the crucial conversations. We'll put those uh, links to those in, in our uh, show notes, because I do think those are, are excellent books to, to get to understand better, not only yourself, but how to deal effectively with other people in a smooth and elegant way. So uh, with that, I want to thank Sean for being our producer tonight and uh, keeping everything running smoothly behind the scenes. Um, it's it's been a lot of fun it. this has been a lot this has been a really fun episode to listen to <laughs> in the background cool yeah it's fun to see uh, you can't quite see if you're if you're watching this but we can see on the the panel and he's nodding his head and kind of you know, listening off. intently it's, <laughs> it's great <laughs> so well everybody have a great weekend and uh we'll be back with you next week All right. good night everybody, everybody.